So welcome to the next instalment of the Nature Trek Online Roadshow. Uh, my name is Georgie Dodds and I will be your host for this evening. Um, this evening I'm accompanied by several of my, my colleagues. Um, we've got Matt from the Nature Trek office and, and several of our tour leaders. Um, and as I say, this is the next instalment of our online roadshow. Uh, some of you may have already joined us for our previous online roadshows. Uh, I think so far we've had cruises at Europe, but we've got plenty more coming up this winter um, and early next year as well. This year we've decided to do a bit of a hybrid. Um, so you might have joined us in the, the previous online roadshows that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, and it's we've just found it's a really great format to be able to bring so many destinations to you uh, and join so many of you from all different parts of the country uh, or even different parts of the globe, actually, which is always very exciting for us to see. Um, but also we love nothing more than, than meeting you in person. And, and sometimes it's fantastic to see people in the flesh. So this year, for the first time again, uh, we've decided to bring back our in-person roadshows. Uh, they will kick off later this month and then we've got some in January. Um, so if you, you would like to, to venture out, then please do come and join us for those as well. But this evening we will focus on British Isles, um, which is an area very close to our hearts, obviously. Um, but Nature Trek actually started as a, a wildlife trekking operator, primarily in the Himalayas, actually, in the 1980s. Um, but since then, the, the UK is becoming even more and more important to us. Um, I think we can all agree that over the last few years, um, we've just really learned a lot more about the fantastic wildlife on our own doorstep. You really don't need to travel far to see some, some really wonderful wildlife. Um, you, we might, I say, have, have people joining us from, from overseas. Um, so again, hopefully we'll be able to introduce you to something new. Um, but um, yes, I say, I'll, I'll introduce you to some of my colleagues. So we've got Matt Ead, um, who is from the Nature Trek office. Uh, so Matt leads all over the world for us. He's actually just come back from Brazil. Um, but he's also very, very passionate about the wildlife of the British Isles, um, particularly in East Sussex, um, where he's a very keen birder on his local patch. Um, but this evening he'll be speaking to you about Shetland, which is another area that he knows very well and is very, very passionate about. Then we'll pass on to Greg Smith. Um, so Greg joins us all the way from the Isle of Col. Uh, again, it's, it's a fantastic area um, that he lives and breathes every day. Uh, and I'm sure he will, um, yeah, he'll make you just as passionate about that as well. We'll then take a short interval uh, for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, so you've got a chance to go and grab another cup of tea or a glass of wine, whatever you fancy, um, before we join um, Martin next, who will be joining us from Devon. Um, so he'll be covering Devon and also Cornwall as well. So we really are covering the length and breadth of the country this evening. Um, and then finally this evening, we'll be heading to Steve Gator. So Steve is our leader from the Northeast. He joins us from, from the area around Durham this evening, um, but he'll be speaking about slightly further north again to about Ardner Merkin, um, which is one of our most popular destinations in Scotland. Um, and that will round off the evening. Um, however, we will have some Q&A at the end of the evening. So we'll get all of our speakers back together to answer any of those burning questions you might have. Please don't wait until the end of the evening, though. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A section um, that we've got here as well. Um, we'll answer some of those questions throughout the evening, um, but then hopefully we'll also have a chance to do that a little bit more in depth as well. So that's enough from me. Um, I will now pass over to Matt uh, and his talk on Shetland. Thank you, everyone. Here we are. Thank you very much. My name is Matt and I'm one of the operations managers here at Nature Trek. Um, I manage a wide range of tours all the way from Southeast Asia up to North America and a fair few places in between as well. Um, and for the purpose of tonight, I will be talking mostly on Shetland, a place very close to my heart. Um, probably one of my most favourite places in Europe, maybe the world, who knows, uh, but it's a, say a place very close to my heart and um, so I manage the tours here there are three tours um, that currently operate on Shetland there's a general tour natural history tour called Shetland's Wildlife uh, we then have a seabird and cetaceans tour which occurs in July and um, then we have an autumn bird migration tour which occurs usually around September and October but for the purpose of this evening it will mostly be our tours in May and June the Shetland Wildlife Tour and this is our standard outline itinerary for these tours it departs Aberdeen on day one and arrives back in Aberdeen on the final day and in between we have three nights on mainland Shetland uh, before 
traversing northwards um, up to Unst and Fetlow, where we have three nights on on the UK's most northern island. So during this time, we get to see uh, many corners of the archipelago and the many wildlife highlights that come with it. So where is Shetland? There it is, quite a long way north above the UK, but roughly on the same latitude as Oslo. Uh, so it's rather distinct a distinct avifauna compared to the rest of the UK that we are used to down here. So the main points that I'm going to talk about this evening um, are arrowed here. So Sumba in the south, uh, we're then going to move up to the island of Musa and the Isle of Nos um, before um, heading northwards up to Fetla and eventually on to the island of Unz. But as I said, in between, we get to visit West Mainland um, and all the other key sites in between. So it really is a fantastic tour. Um, and it's not just the wildlife either. We get to see many of the archaeological sites um, that are famous on Shetland, not just UK famous, but world famous. So this is the ancient settlement of Jarlshof. Um, I hope I've said that correctly. So we get to spend a bit of time here, mainly because it's only a few minutes walk from our hotel, which I shall show you shortly. And we also get to see one of the many brocks which are scattered amongst the archipelago as well. And this is a very well-defined brock uh, just on the outskirts of Lerwick. And I say we get to see many of the fantastic scene scenes here um, around the islands. This is on the west coast of mainland. This is the Isherness Cliffs, um, fantastic geological site. Um, and on a lovely clear sunny day, you really appreciate the waves battering uh, the cliffs there. And there's always farmers knocking about and um, plenty of other bird life as well. In southwest mainland, we also get to go and walk across the Tombolo um, a quite distinct, unique geological feature, um, and this links mainland to St Ninian's Isle. And on occasions, we do also get to walk up to the chapel um, at the very top of St Ninian's, if we're feeling fit enough, that is, or if the wind isn't too strong, maybe. And of course, just, just the general scenery around Shetland is absolutely stunning. It really is, especially on a crisp, clear day such as this. And of course, there's always a Shetland pony not too far away as well. OK, so before I commence, I'm just going to briefly go through the species that we're most likely to see on our tours. Uh, so this is a black guillemot, mostly occurring um, in autumn and winter plumage, this is. And then, of course, we get to see it in its finery spring and summer plumage as well. The common ida, a very common species um, around the shores, um, and you can get some exceptional views such as this. And the beautiful red-throated diver is another classic species that we encounter on our spring tours. And these are, are very common on, on the lochs and lochens, um, and you can get some exceptional views such as this, um, a truly stunning and iconic bird, I feel, of Shetland. Uh, the merlin, uh, the... UK's smallest bird of prey. This is actually the commonest bird of prey on Shetland. And that's basically because there are no large prey items on the island for the larger birds of prey like hen harriers and shorted owls. So the merlins take advantage of the high density of meadow pipits uh, that breed here. Uh, so they do exceptionally well on the island. And you're never too far away from a curlew either. And especially in the spring and summer, the sound of the curlew just resonates across the island. It really is a spectacular scene. Um, usually at midnight, so there's still a bit of light. Um, and all you can hear are the curlews and the golden plovers just whistling and wailing um, in the gentle breeze. It really is absolutely superb. And of course, last but not least, is the Shetland wren. Uh, they they do like their own wren, um, and it's quite distinctly different from the race here on mainland UK. It's slightly larger, slightly longer tailed, a different shade of brown, and it also sounds different as well. Um, and it really is just a, a, a delightful little bird, which usually breeds in the dry stone walls, which crisscross the entire island. And of course, we're never too far away from the otters either. You do have to be a bit lucky to see them, but if you give it time and perseverance, uh, then there's a great opportunity uh, to encounter the otter. Um, there's a very high density, especially on Unst, uh, so we do stand a very good chance on our tours to see this delightful mammal. 
Okay, so I'm just going to start off now at Sumba Head. So on our Shetland Wildlife Tour, we get to spend three nights down at Sumba. Um, and this is our hotel, the Sumba Hotel, very conveniently placed next to the, the ancient settlement of Jarshof, just off to the left there, just creeping into the image. And we're only a few minutes away from one of Shetland's most famous seabird colonies. Um, and mostly here are are the puffins. Now, as I say, it's not too far away from the hotel. There it is, just on the red arrow. And there's me taking the photo from Sumba Head itself. So it's a fantastic location. And so a pre-breakfast excursion can take you to one of Shetland's most famous seabird colonies. And this is what we're really here for. Uh, are the puffins. So some head extremely famous for puffins. And that's because the cliffs here are not sheer vertical. They're slightly diagonal in formation, which means the puffins have a nice landing pad uh, for when they come back to their burrows. Um, and you can get exceptional views as well as they and as they run up to inspect you um, at very close range. So fantastic opportunity uh, to get that wonderful crisp image of a puffin. And if you're lucky, uh, the seas here are very expansive, so a decent scan uh, may well reveal um, a pod of orca. Now, in recent years, orcas have become more and more regular around Shetland waters, and they always show exceptionally well. And that is, that is because they feed on grey and common seals, which are always around the shoreline. So they're always seen inspecting the coastline as they navigate their way around the archipelago. But... I've been there 12 times and this autumn was the first time I have seen them. So you do have to be lucky, but if you go there, you do stand a chance of having a quite memorable and magnificent encounter of a pod of orca. Although I can't exactly say the best time of year to see an orca. Um, you may have that question for me later, but it really they really are quite random in their occurrence. But I would say high summer and, and start of October is usually a good time to encounter them. Okay, so next up uh, is the Isle of Nos. So the previous years, we actually used to land on the Isle of Nos, and this photo is taken from the Isle of Bresse, which is just opposite Shetland's capital of Lerwick. So Nos is the most extreme point of land there, and say so we used to land on there and circumnavigate the island on foot. Nowadays, we actually take a vessel from Lerwick and venture onto um, up to Nos from below and this gives a fantastic uh, view of the cliffs from from below so you get to see the gannets and the orcs leaping off the cliffs in their hundreds of thousands this is one of the largest seabird colonies on Shetland and possibly in the North Sea it really is a spectacular seabird colony and so once we've had the thrill of witnessing all the gannets and orcs leaping off the cliff. We then go off venturing for the feeding flocks. Uh, so these are guillemots, uh, a few bridled guillemots in there as well. The bottom right bird is a bridled. Uh, so we get to see these at extremely close range. And um, we also get to see the fantastic colonies of gannets, uh, which are away from their nest sites and just sitting down on the uh, rocks below the main colony. Uh, so you, it really is a true wildlife um, a fantastic wildlife moment and and it's not just the birds on the way back to shore we actually set up underwater cameras on the vessel which means you get to see what's happening below the surface of the water and there are often a few surprises in store there the boat trip also you'll get fantastic views of arctic terns which is what this chap is um arctic skewer and probably the meanest of all uh, the great skewer or what the locals call the bonksy OK, so next up is probably one of the most famous uh, UK ornithological moments um, possible, um, at least in my eyes. Um, and that is a visit onto the island of Musa. And most in particular is to visit the Brock on Musa. So this is quite atypical from a standard nature trek itinerary. It's a very late night. Um, so we... We sail from Sandwick, which is on mainland, uh, from half past 10 at night. And we sail the 10 minute journey onto Musa and we walk up to this brock. Um, and I say this is to witness one of the grandest ornithological moments in the UK calendar. So just a few facts on Musa Brock before I continue. So it thought to have been constructed in 300 BC and stands a whopping 13 metres tall, which 
It's quite unbelievable, the fact that it's still standing, but it's one of over 120 brocks on Shetland. But comprising this 120 are some that no longer really exist. Uh, they've just been demolished by the wind and the local weather. Uh, but Musa Brock um, is still standing very strong indeed. So brocks are thought to have been made refuge for communities um, and their livestock uh, for protection from the elements of the weather um, and brew and the, and the brock now is now the nesting site uh, for many pairs of European storm petrels, roughly around 400 pairs, whilst the Isla de Musa, which in honesty isn't that big at all, has around 11,000 breeding pairs of European storm petrel. This is Europe's smallest seabird. And so what we do when we get on the island, we walk directly up to the brock and we wait for darkness. So during the day, the European storm petrels are out at sea feeding and they only come in when it's dark. And that is to avoid the predators such as the skewers and the gulls. So they arrive after dark and they are greeted by us standing at the bottom and gawping up, waiting for these bat-like creatures to come circling around the top of the brock and slowly but surely they come down to eye level and eventually if we're really lucky uh, they can land at our feet um, so this is a, a moment from a few years ago that i had um, this is a, a unbelievably a rare european storm petrel at our feet um, so quite a moment for everyone and quite honestly a, a wow moment um, if there ever was one absolutely superb Okay, sadly, I can't go. On, sadly, I can't go on about that. So um, we're slowly moving north um, up to the island of Fetler. Um, this is a beautiful island, a population of only around sixty inhabitants. Um, extremely remote, uh, and it's quite a largest island as well. And it's referred to as the Garden of Shetland due to its lush and fertile landscape. Uh, but most importantly, um, it supports ninety percent of the UK breeding population of redneck phalaropes. Um, completely beautiful bird, um, which I'll show you a photo of very shortly. But on Fetler, um, it's all about the waders in my eyes. Uh, this is the classic scene uh, where you have the waders on the fence post, red shank on fence post, um, golden plover, curlew, just a fantastic noise of an aura. Um, it really is um, a, a stunning, stunning place. Overhead, common snipes are displaying, so you, the constant sound of drumming common snipes is just endless um, on Fetler. And then if you're really lucky, um, well, not really lucky, you, you should see them on our tours, uh, we get to see the redneck phalaropes. And uh, now this is a photo I took a couple of years ago, and I know it's quite awful. Uh, but occasionally, um, especially this year, we had some exceptional views. Um, so here we go. This is a female redneck phalarope from the Isle of from the island of Fetler. Now, what is most extraordinary about this species is that it's only recently been discovered uh, that the breeding population on Shetland winters somehow on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, so just over Colombia. Um, and it's quite amazing that they return to this tiny island of the northeast coast of Shetland. Admittedly, they can land on the water, so it's not as difficult for them, but that is still a mighty journey for such a bird that if you were to hold out your hand, it would fit quite conveniently on your hand. So a remarkable journey for a remarkably beautiful and diminutive bird. It's also very good for, for cetaceans off Fetler. Um, there's plenty of sea to scan and harbour porpoise, not only off Fetler, is quite a common occurrence um, around the archipelago. And uh, you can also see Risso's dolphin off here as well, which I did a few years ago. But the waters here are becoming more and more um, active in terms of cetacean uh, species. So good chance you'll see a minke whale, um, late October humpback whales. Um, it's also very good for white beak dolphin nowadays as well. So there's plenty of options for you for sure. OK, last but not least, uh, the beautiful island of Unst, UK's most northern island. Uh, so as you crisscross your way up to the most northern point, you drive past the most northern fuel station, the most northern house, most northern post office. You can tick all these all these things off as you slowly head north. Uh, but this is the scenery on Unst. It really is a beautiful, beautiful place. These wonderful rows, which 
head into the land. Um, and as, as you can see, it's a fantastic location for spotting otters. Uh, they love these margins, uh, which are uniform with their plumage. We also get to visit and stand on the Shetland Viking longboat uh, for those that are interested. Uh, but it's also a very good spot if you're botanically minded for rare plants. Uh, so on Shetland, there are four species of orchid. This is the lesser tway blade. Um, if you hold out your little finger, it's roughly the size of that. Um, so it's a very small orchid, uh, but well worth seeing if, if you're into your plants. This is the heath spotted orchid. Um, and as you can see from here, stuff from Shetland doesn't really grow very tall. Um, yeah, And I often advise people to, in fact, take a magnifying glass onto Shetland if you are, are into your rare plants. Uh, so these orchids are two of four. The others are frog orchid and northern marsh orchid. Moonwort, if you like that sort of thing, there we go. It's um, absolutely tiny. That is as tall as that one grew, and it's roughly around three or four centimetres. Um, and then the endemic Shetland mouse seal, Edmundston's chickweed, um, is another specialty um, on Unst. And on Unst is the only site where you can find um, this tiny, tiny flower, but all very pretty nonetheless. And we then take a visit up to Hermaness National Nature Reserve. Uh, so it's roughly a 45 minute walk, not too strenuous. Half of it's on boardwalk, half of it's across the moors. Uh, you just got to watch out for the bonksies. Uh, so make sure you take a hat and maybe a walking pole, something like that. Uh, but then when you get to the top, you stand above this fantastic colony of gannets. Um, it really is um, a spectacular sight. So off to the top right, that is Muckleflugger Lighthouse, the most northern point in, in the UK. And all that white on the left of the image, that is either gannet or gannet guano. Um, so there are plenty of gannets in this area. And this short video, I hope it plays, will just give you an understanding of the sheer, sheer density of gannets up here. Okay, just a short video. You may have noticed a couple of puffins off to the right there, but there, so that is a fantastic sight. The video, I'm afraid, doesn't do it much justice, but there we go. But if you do want to see more puffins, then this is the place for it, because there are around 23,000 breeding pairs of puffin um, at Hermanus National Nature Reserve, and they show exceptionally well as well. So if you want that mint image of a puffin, this is the place to come to. And so the views all around are just absolutely spectacular. There we go. All right, folks, that is it for me. I could talk all night on Shetland, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, but sadly, um, I have to pass over to Greg, who's going to talk about the Isle of Cole. But if you do have any questions, I will happily answer them throughout tonight's presentation. Thank you very much for listening and hopefully speak soon. Right. Uh, good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, my name is is Greg Smith. It's lovely to be uh, to be invited along to uh, uh, to join this uh, webinar this evening. I live, as uh, Georgie was saying, I live on the Isle of Cole where I run a small wildlife guiding business called Wildsmiths. And for the last three years, we've been working with Nature Trek to lead a, a, a series of week long tours for them on the island. Um, There's their small group tours, usually seven or eight. And uh, we spread the tours out through the year uh, across the months of May, June and July, uh, kind of reflecting the different wildlife wonders that you're likely to encounter uh, at different times of the Hebridean summer. So, uh, um, I also lead other tours for, let me just, that's moving along. Yeah, there we go. I also lead uh, yeah, other tours in Scotland for Nature Trek, including the absolutely wonderful Islands on the Edge of the Atlantic tour, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a nine day wildlife cruise around the inner and outer Hebrides and uh, heading out to the St Kilda archipelago. Um, so that gives me an excuse to include a photograph from a photograph from uh, Herta there in the bottom right with a lovely fulmer sitting on top of a on top of a wall. Um, so really this uh, this whole talk is just an excuse to uh, um, to show some lovely photographs of, of the island of Col, uh, in which the sun is always shining, the sea is always azure, and the wildlife always performs for the camera, all in an attempt to lure you up. And uh, 
although the focus of my talk is very much on coal, I hope that this might also act as an enticement to other uh, Hebridean uh, adventures which Nature Trek has to uh, has to offer. But uh, before I go any further, let me just uh, explain to you the, the structure of the talk. I think the, the talk will be in three parts. First of all, a bit about Coll itself. Second, an outline of the structure of a typical tour with Nature Trek. And then finally, I'll kind of wander around some of the, uh, the, the main habitats on the island and show you some of the, some of the special wildlife from there. So uh, let me just, so that's the structure, three parts and, uh, and then four bits of, uh, of habitat to, uh, to, to end up with. So um, let's start with a bit about the Isle of Col itself. So first of all, you're gonna ask me, so where exactly is Col? Well, I'm hoping that this map will help. There's a, a map of Scotland and the red square is the, the, the area you want to focus on. Um, uh, tonight, uh, Matt has been talking from Shetland out uh, out uh, north of uh, Orkney. You can just see a bit of Shetland there in a little box that's been snuck down to get it a bit closer to the rest of Britain. Um, later, Steve will be reporting from Ardnamurchan, but for the next 20 minutes, I will we'll be talking about the, the West Coast Islands. And so Col, if I move my cursor, I hope you can see that. Col is here. Um, this, this island here is Col. Um, uh, it sits with its sister Tyree, uh, just a few miles to the west of the Isle of Mull. Um, so uh, just to orientate you on this slightly more uh, uh, detailed map, we've got Oban down over here, um, the um, Morven and Ardnamurchan up on the mainland up there, and Mull over here. And then out in the middle of the Sea of the Hebrides is the island of, uh, of Col. Um, so let's uh, let's move on. So uh, this is uh, this is Cole. This is the uh, the back cover of my uh, OS Explorer 372 map. Um, I, one of the things that I think is really special about Cole is that it's small enough to occupy uh, one side of a one to twenty five thousand OS map sheet, uh, which I, I like. It means there's no fiddly walks so where you're on the edge of the two maps or you're on the fold of the map and you're constantly having to go from one map to the other. So. Uh, um, that, that's one of the reasons I like Col. It's only 13 miles long, about three miles wide, and you can see it's along with Tyree. It's on this this striking kind of northeast southwest uh, orientation. Um, the island has one principal uh, uh, village, which is here, the village of Aranagor, which is our base for the uh, uh, for the week, and which is where the the ferries come into. So. Um, the island has a population of about 170 people. Uh, there are several farm businesses on the island, mostly uh, involved in extensive conservation grazing enterprises with uh, several hundred sheep and, uh, and cows. It's a working island. We're always very respectful of that fact in where we go and, uh, and kind of how we behave. Now, uh, for those of you of a with children of a certain age, you may be familiar with Katie Morag. Well, Cole is the island of Katie Morag and uh, uh, the Mary Hedwick, the uh, author of those books, um, she did a great job, I think, in capturing the essence of the place. So if you're familiar with those books, you'll have a good idea of what the, the lie of the land is on uh, on, on Cull. Uh, the island has 600 species of, uh, of wildflowers. Um, and like most Hebridean islands, it doesn't have many trees. Um, it has 110 regularly occurring species of bird, uh, like these hen harrier and white-tailed eagle. Um, but it's also got uh, uh, some rarities from the biggest fish in UK waters, bottom left, that's the basking shark, uh, to the tiniest, tiniest plant mite. This is a, uh, a little arachnid that lives on the, the galls on the bloody crane's bill, which is only, and you can see these striking, uh, bizarre, twisted growths on the, on the crane's bill. Uh, the crane's bill is quite a common plant in the macca on coal, but... Uh, this uh, this species of mite is only known from a handful of places in uh, in Britain. So, just carrying on with uh, an introduction to coal. The first thing that, that I always think uh, to understand a place, I always think it's important to understand a bit about its geology and a bit about the the history of human land use there. And these two facts explain why coal looks like it does. So we spend a bit of time on the tour looking at the rocks in their different guises. And we talk about the history of human occupation, farming practices over the ages, this sort of thing, which explain the, why the place looks like it does. So Cull is underlain by this ancient Louisian gneiss. Um, that's that wonderful, uh, twisty, convoluted 
banded rock, bottom left. Um, and the nice, uh, it's always playing peekaboo at the surface. You always get in a nice landscape. Sorry, nice, that's a G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, but it's also nice as well. Um, but it gives rise to this kind of lovely, interesting kind of a um, rocky, speckled, speckled kind of a, kind of landscape. Um, the, it's a metamorphic rock, and it's some of the oldest rock on the planet, sculpted in the last two million years by glaciers, which give rise to this characteristic low, rolling, rocky landscape. Um, as we shall see, uh, since the last ice age, uh, the story of Col is very much a West Side story. Uh, it's all about the prevailing wind blowing kind of shelly sands up off the beaches into the lower lying areas, creating sand dunes all along the western flank of the island. And these in themselves then support about 700 hectares of stunning, absolutely mind blowing, uh, unimproved machair grasslands on the on the sand dunes. The highest point on Col is only 106 metres. And from there on a clear day, this will help you with the orientation. Uh, when you look to the north, you can see the Coolins on sky. When you look to the east, you can see Ben Nevis. When you look south, you can see as far as the Paps on Jura, and then to the west, the Western Isles, and beyond them, Canada. Although I have to say that, however hard I stare, I've not managed to see that yet from uh, uh, from the top of the uh, uh, Coles highest point. So let's move then on to uh, the second part of my talk, which is going to be around the the structure of a typical tour. Um, and we'll. Uh, we always start the tour in Oban. So we, I come over to Oban from the island and we all meet up at a hotel. Um, uh, we take a stroll along the seafront with a chance to see uh, the, the black guillemots or tysties, uh, which nest in, uh, in, well, they occur in more, almost every harbour up here. So they're a characteristic of any kind of a enclosed uh, sheltered area along the west coast. Um, we take a stroll along to a local restaurant where uh, uh, where the conversation is often around who we are, why we've booked on this particular tour and what we hope to get out of the trip. And for me, that's a really important start to the week because it gives me a chance to kind of plan the week ahead and shape the week to try and reflect those uh, interests and ambitions. Uh, the next day, it's an early start, I'm afraid. Uh, seven o'clock ferry, or if CalMac are up to its tricks, it could even be a six o'clock ferry, which means a very early start. Um, the crossing takes about three hours and we spend pretty much all of that time, whatever the weather, up on deck. Uh, it's a good test of our warm clothing and our waterproofs. Uh, some people don't believe the joining instructions when they say for a, a trip in Britain in July, you'll need to bring woolly hats and gloves. Um, but they're definitely required as well as your, your sun hats and sun cream. Uh, the crossing usually starts with Harbour Porpoise in the Firth, for, Firth of Lawn, if we're lucky. And if we're not lucky, then you might get a, a lecture from me in the age classification of herring gulls, which at least would, there will definitely be around. Um, there's always plenty to see up the sound of uh, the sound of mull, eagles, terns, gannets and other seabirds. But the, the action really starts once you get out of the sound of mull into the Sea of the Hebrides. Here you'll see uh, you have a good chance, I should say, of seeing uh, cetaceans like this breaching bottlenose dolphin. Uh, vast rafts of uh, Manx shearwaters, which breed in huge numbers down on, uh, um, down on uh, uh, up up on Rum, I should say, just to the north of uh, of Col. So uh, we arrive in Aranagore and uh, we check in at Tainamara, our an award-winning guest house, which is our home for the week. And there's a picture of our hostess uh, Paula, who looks after everyone wonderfully. Um, then uh, I should say that that garden wall made me think that uh, very often in the garden here you'll see hunting hen harriers and there's often a pair of, uh, of common sandpipers displaying to uh, to each other on that uh, on that bit of wall there very close to the bay beyond the bottom left hand photo here shows that bay and uh, in the background is the hotel where we go and have lunch on our first day I should say the award winning coal hotel. Um, and I always think, bottom right, this is the finest bird hide in uh, on the island, perhaps even anywhere in Britain. Uh, in the comfort of, uh, of uh, uh, a nice warm, dry space with some excellent food, you can look out and watch hen harriers and skewers and white-tailed eagles doing their stuff out over the uh, over the moorland to the north. Very, very uh, magical place. Um, we then followed this up with an orientation tour of the island in the minibus. Now, I should say there are only 15 miles of road on Col. And even at my slow speed of driving, 
Um, it doesn't take long to get uh, uh, to get round. So this isn't a holiday where you're going to be spending a lot of time in a minibus, um, uh, traveling to distant sites. Um, unless that is, it's really wet and I take pity on you, in which case we do. We might do two or three tours of the island as orientation. Um, I should say that the photographs on this page are, aren't mine, unlike the others in this uh, presentation, but uh, they've been borrowed from various uh, businesses, the, the respective websites of the, these various businesses that we work with. Um, so the rest of the week, it, basically, we go walking. Um, we take daily walks in different habitats around the, the island with me rattling away enthusiastically in the background. Um, I usually try and involve some locals in the in the walks. That's a picture of my wife on the top right there, um, enjoying the weather. Uh, and we'll do we'll do a, a dawn chorus walk. We'll have my moth trap will be run over a couple of evenings. We'll uh, we'll maybe even have tea and cakes in the garden of my little cottage if you're if you're lucky. But it's a very kind of sociable, very and I hope kind of interesting and diverse week. Um, uh, now, Steve is going to talk a bit later on about a visit to the Treshnish Islands that we always do from the Arden American uh, trips. But uh, we also do this from uh, from Cull. The Treshnish Islands are just a short hop uh, on a rib down from uh, from Cull. And uh, early in the week, we usually try and get down there to visit the uh, seabird colony. Now, I should say there's a whole evening's talk to be had on uh, on the birds of um, uh, of, of uh, the Treshnish Islands and in particular on Lunga. But suffice it to say, this is a unique, almost almost magical opportunity to get up close and personal with, with puffins and to experience a real uh, seabird cliff colony at close quarters uh, where we've got a, something like 15,000 uh, uh, common guillemots breeding. Uh, the boat trip out there in a small rib usually has dolphins bow riding. Uh, and this year, one lucky group had a lunge feeding minke whale not very close to the boat, but close enough for us to see what was going on. That was really exciting. Now, uh, Matt, what was your phrase? You described the Bonksy as the meanest of them all. Well, uh, the, this is uh, in 2021 uh, on our boat trip. We witnessed this extraordinary spectacle of a Bonksy catching, drowning and then plucking a poor Manx Guillemot, the Manx Shearwater. Uh, on the still glassy, clear water, calm water of the sea. Extraordinary, extraordinary experience. And these wonderful photographs, whole series of wonderful photographs taken of that, uh, of that moment. But more from Steve on, uh, uh, on the Treshnish Islands later. So now we're going to move to part three of the talk, where I'm going to talk about uh, four different habitats that we spend our time in uh, uh, on the island, and which reflect the range of wildlife wonders that the uh, island has to offer. Um, now, there's a small area of marginally better agricultural land on the glacial till soils in a glacial valley that runs kind of north south across the island down at the west end. And it's here that there are hay meadows and silage fields. And it's also here that uh, the RSPB established its presence, first of all, in the late 1980s. Uh, always struck me as odd that they should ch choose a piece of farmland rather than these wonderful moorlands and uh, maca habitats. But Clearly, the reason they did is because it's in this farmland that the corn crates hang out. And uh, this bench here is a place that you get used to. We'll spend quite a bit of time sat on this bench scanning the surrounding fields for corn crakes. Uh, the, the corn crake is a really spe special feature of coal. Along with Ty his neighbouring Tyree, we have something like 30 percent of the Brit British and Irish breeding population of corncrake, so a massively declined bird that's doing well, I should say, um, uh, on uh, uh, in these areas. It's been declining in recent years, but this last this year we just had was the best breeding season we've had in some time. So uh, um, uh, the uh, corncrakes arrive here from Africa in about the third week of April, and after a flight of 5,000 miles, they flop down into the undergrowth and say, bug it if I'm going up there again. So uh, you... Um, uh, you, you hear them and their distinctive, repetitive call all around, but uh, seeing them can be quite tricky, even early in the season, like this top right, where the corncrake is taller than the vegetation. But when the vegetation gets taller than the corncrake, then you have to hope that one hops out into up onto a rock like the one bottom left to uh, to give you a view. But it's like with most things in nature, if you spend long enough and you, you're persistent enough, then they do uh, they do perform for you. And we usually there have been very few groups who haven't in, over the course of uh, the last few years managed to see uh, uh, corn crakes on this nature trek. 
door. Uh, so you'll, as I say, you'll get used to this bench. Um, but we do occasionally take a break and uh, head out for a sandwich on a nearby beach if we need a change of scene. But there's also interesting things to be seen from here. The uh, uh, Just to continue uh, Matt's theme of waders on fence posts, here's uh, an obliging snipe, snipe, red shank, lapwing breed down in the wetlands. And they give a fantastic soundscape to our, uh, to our time in this part of the island. But there are also good numbers of twite and cuckoo, bottom right, also sitting on a fence post. Um, and a number of brown hares as well, which were introduced a uh, uh, hundred years or so ago to the uh, uh, to the island. And these do uh, these seem to do quite well, and they give quite they're quite confiding. So they're good photographic opportunities from them. Uh, so I'm now going to move on to uh, the second habitat. That's the the maca. Uh, let me just have a quick check of my uh, my timing. I need to uh, move on quickly. So I run out of superlatives when trying to describe the experience of walking on Coles Maca. Um, suffice it to say, it's packed with huge variety of both common and less common wildflowers, supplemented by the occasional proper rarity. And all that botany in turn supports an amazing diversity of invertebrates. Um, uh, this image uh, illustrates a small number of the wildflowers that we get to enjoy. The, the bloody cranes bill is a common feature. We saw the uh, the Assyria gall that uh, that uh, the mite that um, uh, infests it, but uh, that candelabra structure, that wonderful seed head structure, is a wonderful wonderful uh, feature. In the June slacks, bottom left, we get to see the amazing range of forms of the early marsh orchids by their thousands. Uh, this is the gorgeous coccinia form. Uh, some of the rarities include the Irish ladies' tresses you've got there in the in the middle, um, which is a, a late summer orchid and one of Britain's rarest. And there are several sites for this on Col. Um, the bottom right one is an interesting one. It's like quite a, quite esoteric. It's quite an obscure dandelion called the many lobed dandelion. Now I'm the type of botanist who calls a dandelion a dandelion. I don't go into naming all the micro species, but this one kind of spoke to me uh, when we uh, when we spotted it on an H trek tour a couple of years ago. Um, and I posted a photograph of it on Twitter and uh, we set a little corner of Twitter alight, the uh, uh, the dandelion loving corner of Twitter. Turns out that this uh, pretty little plant is now extinct in England and only occurs in half a dozen locations on sand dunes around the Scottish coast. And this was the first modern record from the Isle of Cull. So that was very exciting. Um, a range of uh, range of invertebrates that I've uh, that I mentioned Um uh, several rare and distinctive bee species. The great yellow bumblebee occupies the Hebridean maca. And uh, this is the Hebridean form of the Moscada bee, which we regularly see. Uh, we keep an eye out for butterflies. This is the uh, the common, uh, fairly kind of frequently uh, uh, found dark green fritillary. But we also have maca specialists like that, that wonderful belted beauty, which is a fantastic micro moth. Uh, not a micro moth, but it's a, it's a fantastic little moth. Um, Lots of archaeology too, bottom right. This is a, and on Col, it's often more than just the lumps and bumps, a bit like Matt's amazing photographs of rocks and so on. Um, this is a Bronze Age kist burial that was uh, uncovered in the dunes in the 1970s, and you can clearly see the outline of the stones there. Um, now, the beetle top right is one of Col's very special bits of wildlife, the short necked oil beetle, extinct in the UK since the 1940s. It was uh, discovered on Col by the RSPB warden in 2008. Um, now, I've no time to explain the amazing lifestyle of this fat, flightless little beauty, um, but uh, it does demonstrate a whole a whole kind of new corner of evolutionary innovation. Uh, and since its discovery on Col, it has colonised several neighbouring islands, and I'll leave you to try and work out how a flightless beetle might do that. Uh, the coast comes next. So just quickly around the coast, uh, there's always fantastic things to see on the 25 glorious beaches which Col has. Uh, classic Hebridean beaches, um, but there's no time to sit around soaking up the rays. Uh, we usually clock up a dozen or more species of kelp and rack washed up on the uh, on the beaches. And here we're conducting our very own alien autopsy on a huge specimen of fur billows. And our beach combing is often watched by uh, curious seals, in this case, a couple of grey seals peering at us. Now, uh, otters, we regularly see signs of otters, sprites, runs and, uh, and footprints. and we frequently get to sniff their poo as well, um, but we only occasionally run into them in person. Uh, there's a good population on coal, but the best chance of seeing them is early in the morning. And this photograph, bottom right, was taken on a nature trek trip by the most wonderful photographer, Andy Naylor. Uh, I recommend you look up his website. 
Um, he was out at 5 a.m. every morning and every day he managed the most amazing photographs of otters. You can imagine by the end of the week, everyone else was setting their alarm clocks early to be able to join him. Um, uh, we occasionally see basking sharks from the beaches. Um, uh, uh, this is a kind of the dis distinctive shape of them, kind of with uh, uh, their dorsal fin and, uh, and tail fin showing. Um, as they kind of swim around hoovering up plankton. Uh, usually these are best seen later in the summer, but this one, this individual we saw um, uh, with the May group uh, from uh, uh, with Nature Trek uh, in May this year. Um, we do find amazing other things on, on the beaches like uh, a jellyfish, mermaids purses. Um, this is the, the, the mermaids purse of a, or the, the eggs case of a flapper skate. Um, which is the biggest skate and the biggest uh, uh, egg case. Uh, it looks like a size 13 to me, as you can see, modeled next to my big boots. Um, we often come across these wonderful uh, by the wind sailors, um, fantastic colonial hydroids with a chitinous sail that you could, dis you could uh, disregard just as a little bit of plastic, but absolutely wonderful things. And even one lady last year found this sea bean. It's the seed from a liana which has been washed by the Gulf Stream all the way from a tropical rainforest in Central America, all the way across the Atlantic to wash up on our beach here. You can see a little goose barnacle that has a hitch to ride with it. So last of all, a quick jog around the moorland. I'll be very, very brief. Fantastic range of, uh, uh, it's the dominant, dominant habitat on coral, I should say, it occupies about 70% of the island, typically made up of wet and dry heath communities, sphagnum dominated peat bogs, and then uh, about 60 lochs and lochans with open water plant community communities. Um, wetland plants are wonderful, like the stunning water lobelia on the left. Uh, the ridiculously rare pipewort in the middle there with its nonchalant array of flowering spikes. Uh, several types of uh, insectivorous plants, including this sundew on the right. Um, the moorland area is designated as SPA. Uh, is, we've got two species of breeding skewers. Uh, in the middle there, you can see the bonksy, the great skewer, and to the right, the elegant uh, um, arctic skewer, and to the left, the red-throated diver, whose barking calls provide a kind of soundtrack to the summer on coal. Um, uh, there's a fabulous place where we, uh, uh, a roadside loch, where we often stop to watch both species of skewer having a wash up. And there was an occasion last year when a pair of red-throated divers came in and sat on the loch next to them. And then a gleaming male hen harrier flew across the uh, the moorland behind. An absolutely magical, magical moment. Moorland has a, a fantastic range of other interests. Some fabulous invertebrates like this uh, green tiger beetle, which they've newly arrived on coal. We've only started seeing them in the last couple of years. Wonderful range of orchids. My favourite, the one on the right there, is the heath fragrant orchid. Uh, which we uh, we have ritualistically we kneel down and cup our hands around it and sniff the uh, the sublime and uh, sacred aroma of the uh, uh, of the orchid. There are several celebrities on coal from the world of books, sports, and uh, film whom we occasionally bump into. But uh, but this old last twisty is always a favourite um, uh, with our with our guests. So I'll leave you with a um, uh, uh, another classic flower from the Macca. The moss saxifrage. So, like our tours, I've rather run out of time. But uh, so there are tours in May, June, and July to Cull, each with a different set of priorities and different uh, interests to see. Um, uh, my guiding philosophy is very much one of going to nice places and experiencing the wildlife that comes along, rather than chasing around trying to find things. So, if you like to visit remote and beautiful places, find amazing wildlife in good company with great food, then um, this town, this is going to be the tour for you, but I'm beginning to sound like an H Trek brochure, so you <laughs> cut me off now, Georgie. There's nothing wrong with that. We all love an H Trek brochure. Thank you so much for that Thank great. You. That was um yeah, really inspired me. So that was fantastic and, and Matt as well. So um I hope you've all enjoyed the first part of our evening there um, around Scotland. Um this evening we will take it's it's now a very short to break. It's um a three-minute break now that we'll take. Um, but we'll resume at 8.25 um, when we will be heading right down south with Martin. We'll take us down to Devon. Um, so, yes, just have a, have a quick loo break now and we'll see you again in a couple of minutes.
the tour we're talking about is in uh, North Devon, and uh, it's based on the, um, the 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 town of uh, small town of Woolacum, uh on the west coast there, um, just by Woolacum Bay, and um, we uh, visit most of the a lot of the coastline and uh, the um, stunning range of habitats we've got here you know rocky cliffs huge sand dune systems and um an undeveloped estuary of uh, two significant rivers the tor and the torridge and coastal moorland and a bit of exmoor national park which features a uh, temperate rainforest and uh, there's also good freshwater grazing marsh and salt marsh it's all part of the unesco biosphere for north devon which is the first biosphere in the uk and it's all uh, in an area of outstanding natural beauty as well. So quite a diverse range of habitats. Um, it's based in in uh, Woolacum, which really is a is a little town that hasn't changed much in uh, in uh, 50, 60 years. It would look exactly the same that view if you took it, you know, just after the last war, which is rather nice. It's all, all the landscape is protected by national trust, and uh, we have uh, our bases at. Uh, the magnificent Woolacombe Bay Hotel, which is four star, has uh, um, large grounds right right on in the dunes, tucked up in the dunes and right on the water's edge, um, both indoor and outdoor swimming pools. And of course, the sea, if you want to swim in it and a spa and very good brasserie style restaurant that we use. And they give us a, a little private area there, which is, is great. Um, the first evening we go out onto the um, onto the dunes at Willacombe Warren um, with the National Trust. And um, that's uh, always very popular. It's a very good way of meeting people. And after an early dinner, we have a couple of hours looking at uh, what the National Trust have done on the, on the dunes to reduce the bramble and um, scrub and encourage wildflowers. And they use this pioneering electronic cattle grazing system where the cattle have collars and they're restricted in the areas they can graze without trashing the whole the whole area in the winter. And that's resulted in some great stands of, of wildflowers, including these pyramidal orchids and the usual uh, birdsfoot trefoil and rest harrow and yellow rattle and so on. And then you've even got bee orchids starting to appear in the marron grass in the dunes. And it's uh, usually pretty near midsummer. So, um, you know, it's still full daylight at uh, at nine o'clock at night, nine thirty. So, uh, really nice uh, way into the into the tour. And then the next day, we go over to um, uh, Braunton and uh, look at Braunton Burrows, which is one of the UK's largest uh, dune systems. Um, it's over nine hundred hectares and about three miles by one mile, and um, it, it's been subject to a five-year um, EU funded dynamic dunescapes project, which has created these areas of bare sand and removed a lot of invasive scrub, things like um, um, sea buckthorn and um, and uh, and uh, bramble and so on. And that's been encouraging sand lizards and lots of species of flowering plant, including the orchids and, and the brown banded cardaby, which is uh, becoming more and more common there, which is nice. Um, we use um, the services of Mary Breeds. She's in the top left-hand picture there in the in the red top. She's been in the area for over 40 years and she's written the, the authoritative guide to uh, the burrows. Um, about 600 species of flowering plant, including 11 orchids uh, that have been recorded and five of those are widespread. So we would very like to see pyramidal, southern marsh, early marsh, tway blade and marsh helleborine. And uh, here's a fragrant orchid, which is uh, part of that 11. And it's also pretty good for butterflies uh, on its day. So dark green fritillaries and brown argus can be seen. Um, and there's large areas of, uh, of dune turf with um, birds for trefoil, thyme and ladies bed straw, yellow rattle and so on. And the sand pansy, which is a, a favorite little tiny viola tricolore. Um, but some of the rarities, some true rarities in uh, Braunton are the water germanda, which is only found in Braunton boroughs and northern boroughs, so just the other side of the river, and one other site in Cambridgeshire, I believe. So pretty rare, but usually flowers a bit later than our tour. Our tour runs in uh, the end of June, 
So this flower is usually later in July or August, so we don't often see that. And then but the other rarity that's quite uh, spectacular is the sea stock, which is a lovely um, coloured, violet coloured, pink violet coloured plant in the in the dunes. And that's only found in North Devon and on the southwest Wales coast. And we also have the, the round headed club rush, which I don't have a shot of, unfortunately, but it's a very spiky rush with uh, with club heads of flowers. Just a, in a few sites at Braunton Burrows is the stronghold and the uh, marbled white, another example of the fair common butterflies that you can see here. Then the day uh, three, we're off to Hedden Valley in Exmoor, which is a north facing valley, which features this um, spectacular temperate rainforest down its sides. And these have been made uh, quite better, much better known by Guy Shrubsole in a recent book that he wrote about it. It's mainly oak and ash. And amazingly, it was planted. It was, it was planted by man in the last, uh, well, the 19th and 20th, early 20th century. Um, so it's not, um, you know, it's not hit, um, uh, virgin forest it, by any means. It's very managed, but the uh, wonderful trees that have resulted, the stunted growth with covered in moss and epiphytes and so on, um, is really nice to look at. And Aviva have just given 50 million pounds of funding for restoring this kind of habitat in the UK. And quite a lot of that's coming to Devon. Again, National Trust managed as is nearly the whole coast along uh, De North Devon. And we uh, we borrow Jack Ward, our, our fantastic National Trust uh, head ranger and a great ecologist. And he talks about the rewilding work they, they're doing, just letting trees fall over and uh, allowing uh, um, boughs to fall off and split and f provide places for bats to roost in and so on. Whereas before the National Trust would have managed it much more tightly and, and um, neatly. And now they're all enjoying the fact that, that they can let let uh, nature rip, as it were. They're even planning to, to get beaver in and, and even water buffalo in the future to help with the rewilding uh, um, activities. So fantastic place and good for butterflies in the valley floor and on the on the uh, south facing side so you can see three different fritillaries silver washed high brown small pearl borders the high brown high brown being the, uh, the highlight that's only uh, only seen in um, this area and a few others in the UK quite a quite a scarce butterfly and, and nice dragonflies golden ring there and a green hair streak too so it's so a one mile walk down to the sea and we will see uh, guillemots razor bills from the, from the colony just adjacent on the cliffs at Woody Bay. And we come back and have lunch at the fantastic uh, Hunter's Inn um, and um, really good pub food. And then we go up the valley and look for lesser horseshoe bats in, in the church at Trentishoe and uh, search out the high brown fertilities up the valley sides. Um, so quite a, a nice day. Then day four is is a whole day trip to Lundy, which uh, was an early start uh, with 6.30 a.m. breakfast. Um, departure from Biddeford gives um, six hours ashore. And uh, we again use a local expert, Martin Unwin, great birder. And uh, we have a two hour ferry journey and um, that's great for sea watching. So you see um, porpoise dolphins, commonly um, common dolphins, uh, gannets passing by from from Pembrokeshire, guillemots and puffins, and manxes and seals, all of which uh, are present on on Lundy itself. It's a steep climb up to the village um, to uh, the Morisco Tavern and the church. Morisco Tavern's great pasties and really good for. Uh, lunches and we've dived in there a few times when it's been wet which occasionally it is in Devon I have to say but um, usually it doesn't last too long it's uh, uh, the, the weather moves on pretty quick and the the lovely old stone walls on, on Lundy are very popular with the uh, the northern wheat ears that are, that are very much in evidence at that time of year and we even see things like um, um, from the boat, we'll, we've seen summer plumage, plumage uh, great northern divers this far south. 
and um, Manx Shearwaters, which is a very large uh, colony. When, when we um, reach the top, after quite a steep climb from the boat, we head off to the west coast to Jenny's Cove, where is the main the main sea colony uh, sea bird colony is. And you might either have seen see dolphins from the cliffs or a minky whale there from the we saw from the boat. Um, but the main attraction is the um, for everybody wants to see a puffin when they go there. And we we increasingly seeing great uh, increases. So if I tell you that um, when uh, there were rats on the island, so 2001, there were 13 puffins on, on Lundy. It was right down to that. And last year, there were 1,335. So a, a thousandfold increase in um, in puffins in, in uh, just over 20 years. So fantastic uh, results from that. And that's also resulted in um, things like 25,000 Manx shearwaters, where 95% of the UK population, breeding population, uh, come, come from Lundy. So it's amazing what that uh, program has done. So Lundy is a real conservation success story. It's really heartwarming to, to see what's happened there. Of course, it was also the first uh, UK no-take zone or marine conservation zone, as it's called. So a very, very special place. And you know, it seems uh, you can do a, a nature trek tour and have, uh, I think, th four nights on Lundy, but that's a different tour. This is just a taster, and, and I think a lot of people will want to come back um, when they've seen it. A very special place indeed. Then the final um, morning, we uh, we do a walk along Mort Point, which is where the Bristol Channel meets the um, meets the Atlantic Ocean. You just see Lundy there on the horizon on the left-hand side. So Lundy's about uh, uh, 21 miles off the point there. Um, and you have, because of its situation, you have these upwellings of nutrients from the channel, meaning there's lots of fish. Um, there's a small uh, seal group gather, gathers there in the summertime. And um, we get great views of them because they're, we're looking down at them from, from up on the cliff. And um, we again, we have a local guy, Dave Jenkins, who, who has been ill, but he's uh, hoped, hoped to join us again next year. Um, and he's uh, found, a, for the last few years, the nesting site of a pair of kestrels and wonderful views of the juveniles. They're just about to fledge. Um, so the whole um, landscape there is again grazed by these lovely belted Galloway cows that are, are um, um, restrained by, by their GPS collars where the farmer can program on his iPad where the exactly where the cattle go and where they can't. So uh, a lovely uh, end to the tour and we have uh, lunch in the uh, Shipper Ground pub and uh, depart from, from North Devon. So moving swiftly on, we then have our tour in um, Cornwall, which is feet on the, the southernmost part of the UK mainland. We've gone from seeing Earlier on, we've seen the northern part of the, uh, the whole UK island chain, but this is the very south point of the UK because the Channel Islands actually aren't in the UK, I, I learned when I lived there. So the hotel there is um, marked with that heart at um, near Falworth and um, very, very comfortable place. And we venture out daily from there. So great food again, um, lovely setting with a view of the, uh, of the English Channel and uh, in its own grounds and very close to Falmouth. So that's a super location and good food too. Um, so the first day on the tour I was leaving, I've only led one tour that I was standing in, but we went off to the Lizard and walked some of the coastal path, Hynans Cove and, and Gunwallow, looking for um, the, um, the species on the title of the tour, the uh, the, the the chuff, and uh, the Cornish chuff. So we uh, took some time to find them because, and in fact, we we were quite lucky because we found a pair on the actually 
actually feeding amongst the hot and top fig, which of course is an invasive species, which covers large areas of the cliffs um, and badly needs to be managed, but uh, the chuffs seem to like it anyway. And they're really acrobatic um, birds when, when they're flying around in a breeze uh, with these wonderful evocative calls and they're Cornwall's county bird. But in fact, they died out in the county in 1973 and um, three birds became resident again back in uh, 2001 and of those a, a pair formed and they nested in 2002 and uh, raised some chicks by last year um, 112 chicks have been fledged from 39 nests so it's a really good story about um, again conservation at work and there's a dedicated team led by RSPB um, that has uh, helped them along because they, they need special grazing uh, length of turf that, that uh, they need to be able to fossick around with that wonderful long bill for earthworms and grubs and stuff. All a bit precarious because most of those birds are descended from that original pair, but um, never mind, they're making great, great, great headway. So the next day we go off to uh, Woodland Valley Farm, which is at uh, Laddock, which is about... Um, an hour away from the hotel, just north of Truro. And we um, learn all about conservation farming and uh, organic farming, conservation grazing, things like mob, mob grazing, where the herd is um, restrained by electric fences and it grazes a specific area for just a day, and then it's moved on again. So th the ground doesn't get poached or trampled too much. and any wildflowers that are starting to 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 grow aren't aren't absolutely trashed, and that's that seems to be working really well for them. They've got these areas of wood pasture now that they're working on very hard. And the beavers, um, Chris Jones, who owns the farm, has introduced beavers into a um, enclosure, which is the only legal way you can do it. Um, and it's about a kilometre of fencing in, enclosing. You're not aware of it being an enclosure at all. Um, you can't usually see them in the daytime, which is that when that picture of the beaver dam was taken. We're shown around the enclosure in the daytime. And then we go off and have a really good pub supper at the Falmouth Arms in Laddock and come back at about 8.30. And the beavers come out as it gets uh, towards dusk at about nine. And uh, we have really good views of them swimming around. They like to cruise around the lakes they've they built. Um, before they, they settle down and start uh, preening and, and so on. And, and then as it gets dark, that's when they do these massive felling activities and trees come crashing down. They're real landscape engineers and it's fascinating to see what they've done. And it's actually has already had an impact on flooding in the village of Ladock, which is great. And uh, hence Chris is now more popular than he was at bringing beavers back to the landscape. So that's really, Great, um, great day. And another day out is on a boat, a pelagic boat trip from Falmouth um, with Keith Leaves, who's uh, been running, running boats for 25, 30 years. And he's just got a brand new catamaran um, in the last year. I, I led the tour in 2022 and he still had this monohull um, and um, he had this uh, young student aboard who had the sharpest pairs, pair of eyes I have ever come across. He really was amazing at spotting stuff. So he would, would see that great northern diver from about half a mile away. And uh, he was invaluable to have on board. So we thought, saw things like that again in, in the summer plumage, um, which is quite unusual to find in, in the English Channel at that time of year. And the gannets come cruising by from my old uh, stomping ground of Alderney about 60 miles away and we then we head out about seven or eight miles out into the channel so we really are getting into the deeper parts of the English Channel um, and um, we we were joined by a, a school of common dolphins but I know that Oliver uh, who led this tour last year he had he was lucky enough to see not only common but also short beaks and um, Risso's dolphin as well on the same trip so Fantastic. We only saw that one one species of cetacean, but there are plenty more out there. 
then we head back in in towards Dobman Point, which is to some way to the east of Falmouth to make it a circuit and find the seabird colonies. So these are shags on the top left hand corner and uh, into Gull Rock, which is a great place, an island just off um, the coast where grey seals are uh, fishing and um, really good colony of um, guillemots and razorbills you can get close up to and um, not to be outdone we've had bridal guillemots on every uh, tour so far but we can do them as well so that's uh, nice to see them there too so that's my uh, my two tours from the west country and uh, we're heading back north now we're going back to western scotland we're not going to be far away from greg's uh, tour on call we're going to the peninsula of Ardnamurchan in uh, Gaelic Ardnamurchan. I'm not sure how I pronounce that well, but 20% uh, of the inhabitants on Ardnamurchan are Gaelic speakers. So no doubt they will tell me in, in due course. As Georgie said earlier on, Ardnamurchan is a very popular tour. There are lots of choices that you have. You can go in May, June to have a look at uh, Wild Scotland in spring. You can save up your time to go in August, September to have a look at mammals particularly. And uh, then the alternative is September, October for the red deer rot. And you can go on at all three times, of course. Uh, you can have a tailor-made um, holiday. You can go for five days. You can go for eight days. There are lots of opportunities. It's a wonderful place to go to. And this is why because there are three features of Ardnamurchan that are shared with, with the other uh, venues that we've been uh, witnessing this evening. Tranquility is the first one. The weather isn't always like this. It's nice when it is a calm day, just uh, at the start of the morning with the sun rising and the, um, uh, the scenery is spectacular and the wildlife is, is wild and plentiful. This spot is uh, really helpful because it is fi a five minute walk from the Arnhemurken bunkhouse, which is our accommodation we share um, with no one. We have um, the whole centre booked out for ourselves. We have accommodation uh, in, in the eight, eight rooms. We have a uh, dining area and a lounge and a kitchen. And we have it to ourselves. So it can be party time, it can be quiet time, it can be anything. If you want to come down here by yourself or with the group, it's absolutely fine. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to, oh, just a minute, there's uh, there's some deer swimming across the lock there. Did you see them? Uh, did you, oh, hang on, there's uh, dipper going across and kingfisher. And in fact, you know, we've had over the, the course of this year, we've had all of the, uh, the big five uh, Scottish animals, people go to Scotland to see red deer, Otter, golden eagle, red skull, seal, all from this this spot, uh, and much, much more. Red deer stag. Well, it looks mean. Uh, he's uh, his royal stag. He's got twelve points or tines. He's got his um, uh, his mane there. He's it, it. It's been a wet day, as you can tell. But actually, he that that's to his credit because he's absolutely stuck full of testosterone. This is uh, in September. He's He's been wallowing in the mud. He's probably smeared himself with his own urine and, and sperm. Um, he's, in, he's in a really macho condition because his job there is to signpost to any other stag daring to uh, uh, come across near him that this is his territory. He's guarding these beauties, his harem of hinds, about 20. Uh, in this particular harem, they are looking closely at us and we're looking closely at them. We're not far away from each other. The hinds there um, have got their ears pricked. They're quite well aware of what's happening and yet they know that they can run away. They know they're in no danger whatsoever. So the one at the back, the young one, uh, is feeding and we're feeding as well. We're taking advantage of a lunch break watching these wonderful animals. And later on, we're seeing these young ones as well. They're having a, a playful sparring uh, exercise. They're getting used to the feel of the antlers. They're trying to get their head around it, if you pardon the pun. And it's a little bit of play, but there's a serious intent here because when they reach eight years and maturity, this is going to be not play, 
but real battle because they're going to be fighting for dominance to be the alpha male. They want to have the hind and nothing else. So it's helpful to be able to see this in, in action and not far away either. So I won't show that again because I'll press the right button on this occasion and see if we can get, yes, we have. Here's the red squirrel. Red squirrels um, are not that common on Arden Merkin. They, they're not as common as perhaps they, they ought to be. But when you see them crossing the road on a, on a night trip, uh, we also see them coming um, up from Glasgow and back again. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful animals to see. This one's sitting very tamely in the tree just at the back of the Arden Merkin bunkhouse where we're staying. We've had them, a couple of uh, adults chasing the youngster up the um, fence as well. So when we see them, we simply enjoy the spectacle and the photographers uh, enjoy the opportunity to uh, take some fantastic pictures to boot. And how about this one? What a beauty, what a cute fella, the Pine Martin, absolutely stunning. The Pine Martin is thriving and Arthur Merkin. It was persecuted at one time. It's now protected and it's really enjoying itself. In the wood. We're surrounded by woods and the um, bunkhouse, and we have plenty of opportunities to see pine martins as we drive in, in the nighttime, uh, and equally uh, around the bunkhouse itself, and quite literally right on the back uh, of the bunkhouse itself. So this is, is a clip of a pine martin. Sometimes you get one, two, three. Uh, here it's feeding, and oh, just a minute, it hurts something there. Someone is moving about, you'll see a, a reflection soon uh, in the glass. We're simply watching this pine martin eating its bait. It's been put out some um, peanut butter and jam sandwiches, yum, yum, uh, that it will uh, feast on. And then off it goes, it will, it will uh, run away and come back again. In the summer, we can often have this, this view in full daylight uh, and the late evening uh, nine o'clock-ish, 10 o'clock. In the uh, later trips, it's often in darkness, but we have the lights on. The Pine Martin isn't uh, affected by that, isn't uh, unduly worried by it. It simply continues to uh, feed. And I've witnessed them feeding at 12 o'clock, uh, half past three in the morning. We've had trail cameras on them. They're there throughout the night. They'll finish off everything. And what they don't eat perhaps will be taken by badger or fox. Uh, there's a whole host of, of animals looking for the food and enjoying it just as much as we are. Not sure if you can see the two little blobs. I'll uh, just circle them there, but you will from this next image. It's taken by a client uh, with a bridge camera and fantastic. We were looking through binoculars, uh, scope, uh, and he was photographing from the boat, which was on the calm water. And the eagles here, the uh, white-tailed sea eagles, were simply sitting, watching, taking no notice of anything other than uh, what was on their horizon. And it could be one, two miles away. And of course, they're ready. For, look at those, just look at those tin openers, those yellow tin openers. They're absolutely massive. The bird is absolutely massive. It will tear shreds out of its prey within minutes. Uh, it's a, a, an absolute privilege to be able to see these birds. and white-tailed eagles, sea eagles, uh, are becoming more and more common. They're displacing uh, perhaps the golden eagles, still seeing golden eagles, but not as many as these beauties. And where is all this happening? Well, it's on the Ardnamurkan Peninsula. So this is this here, bit here sticking out into the Sea of Hebrides. Here's Col that Greg was talking to us about earlier on. Here's the Isle of Mall and the Sound of Mall. And uh, up here we, we have the islands, which I'll point out in a minute. And the Loch Sunna Sea Loch here, coming along and deline delineating the southern part of the peninsula. The western part, this is the point of Arden Merkin, which is the most westerly point of the mainland Britain. The north uh, side here. And then we will have a look at basically this this area here the longest trip we would take is about 18 miles the roads from Salon 
are mostly single track, which slows us down so we can actually see the scenery and the wildlife from the bus. And it will probably take us no more than 40, 45 minutes uh, for the longest journey. This part here is Ben Hyant, which I'll talk about shortly. And I'll just take you back um, over here because we're starting from Glasgow, pick up to air the airport and uh, railway. And we drive alongside Loch Lomond, uh, looking at the wildlife as we, we go, cross uh, Rannoch Moor, uh, through Glencoe, to the pinch point here at Corran, where there's a ferry across Loch Linney to take shorten the journey for us to go to Strontian and beyond and eventually re reach our destinations, which is Glenborodale. The ferry at the moment, and for the most of the trips this year, has been out of operation. So we've had to take a, 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 an hour's detour, which has allowed us to have fantastic views of Ben Nevis and pick up uh, birds along the side of Loch Eel and the top end of Loch Linney as we're going along. So about 50 square, square miles uh, of a peninsula. And this is Glen Coe. Uh, it's both daunting and dizzying and dreadful. Daunting because of the hugeness of it, a, a glaciated U-shaped valley. Dizzying because of the verticality of the, uh, the cliffs. And dreadful because of the massacre that took place there on the 13th of February, 1692. Which is a story that is told to us later on in the week, at some stage, by Neil Rowantree, who lives in the house next to the bunkhouse, he has been working and living in Arden America for the past 30 odd years. He knows everything that needs to be known about Arden America and its wildlife. And his passion and his authority uh, entertain us for a full hour, if not more. It really is a, a treat and a privilege to listen to Neil. We head across to the, the Western Point, the lighthouse. Uh, one of the many lighthouses, in fact, all but one, built by Robert Stevenson or his family. Not Robert Stevenson of the George and Robert Railway Stevensons, but the grandfather of Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island and other books for children. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, story behind that. The, the, the lighthouse itself is well worth visiting just to see what's inside and above, but also to have this panoramic view of the sea towards the uh, upper islands of Mock and Rom, sky with Cullins, just, just picking through the, the clouds there and egg. And we're looking on the sea for uh, gannets, shearwaters, skewers, divers, black guillemots, the birds that we've been seeing earlier on in the other presentation. We've got a good chance to be able to see lots of them. And we're looking for cetaceans, uh, including minke whale. Uh, and we've, we've had some good sightings uh, this year in particular. One of our boat trips, full day trip, is to uh, Staffer Island. And you can almost, almost hear the waves calling in that dark, oops, come back again, in that, bar, uh, in that dark area here. There's two sea, sea uh, caves here. This is the one where we follow in the footsteps of Mendelssohn. So we're listening to da da de dum dum of the waves. It's an absolutely eerie and awesome experience. But so too is looking at the basalt columns here, uh, the result of the volcanic rocks solidifying slowly and then uh, at different rates of uh, solidification above and below and folding. We have an hour on the island. We can walk into the cave or we can walk onto the top and have a look at the bird nests up there. And Greg was telling us about his trip to this island, Lungi, uh, Lunga, um, where it's, it's Seabird City. And one of the things that's difficult to do is to keep on walking when you see these puffins. We've seen lots of them already this evening. And every time they're absolutely amazing, amazing uh, birds to see. They, like, like everywhere else, they are tame. They will uh, simply stand and chatter whilst the paparazzi of photographers uh, uh, ease their, their cameras out and take as many pictures as they possibly want. Hopefully, though, eventually we'll get along to Seabird City and we'll be having a look at the, at the, uh, the Guillemot 
colony particularly. Um, you can, as you can see, it's it's uh, it's packed. The more birds there are, the better protected they are from the uh, monks and bunkses, the, uh, the the great skewers that are nesting uh, up above. And um, it's a smelly place. It's a noisy place. And you've got to get on with your neighbours, which is probably what's happening with the Razor Bill and the Guillemot here. They're having a good chat to see what's going on uh, and making sure that all is well. One of the highest points in the peninsula is this uh, this spot here, Ben Hyant. It's um, uh, a, a mixture of different rocks, uh, so some fantastic geology. And it looks down onto the, um, uh, the sea here with this nose, McAllen's nose, and we're looking across here at um, the Isle of Mull. This is a wonderful place for looking for uh, raptors of all kinds and eagles of both kinds, the sea eagle, the white-tailed, and the uh, the goldie itself. We get uh, Merlin uh, flying across. If we walk down into the bay, the Bay of Strangers, we can pick up uh, waders of different types, curlews, oyster catchers, uh, turnstone, and, and so on. And there's quite a lot of uh, archaeology there to uh, to enjoy. Uh, this this part of the peninsula was quickly inhabited after the uh, ice retreated of the last ice age, and uh, there's evidence of Neolithic um, um, settlement, Bronze Age settlements, Viking. Uh, settlements and so on. It's a very, very interesting place. But the main reason for being there is, is to spot, look at them, the barn door wings, they're absolutely massive. The white tail is, is there, the, uh, the tin opener, the yellow tin opener beak is, is there, but the size of those wings is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's unbelievable, you've got to see it. Uh, and very often we do see uh, pairs of birds like this. We take a, a, a boat trip uh, on Loch Sunna, which is the sea lock at the south end of the uh, peninsula. We'll either go to have a look around this island here, or we'll go out to the sea itself. Uh, we'll, we're looking for seals, so common harbour seals in this case, dog-like uh, um, heads, faces, and we're also looking for cetaceans. So we've got them on both sides of the boat. This, this major, this building up on the other sides of the boat. We've got them on the We've got common dolphins. One of about 30 of the cetaceans. Not most of the boat, which would be some further away, uh, which would be some just to the top of the left. Back at the uh, other side of Ben Hyant, uh, this is a, a place called Curl Corn. And if you've been watching the uh, series on Channel 4, Wilds of West Scotland by Hamza Yassin, this is where he lives. He lives um, on the just at the back of the, this picture, which is looking at the jetty. And he's able to walk out every morning and probably see otter every morning if, he, if he's lucky. Uh, the, this type of habitat is absolutely perfect for otter. And if you're lucky again, like the client was on this occasion when she took her smartphone camera out and took the video of these two otters, you'll see everything that you want to see about an otter. It's a, a, a beautiful animal. Here it's been, the pair have been feeding, they're going off uh, swimming, the heads up. You will see them arching their back as they dive and the tail flicks up a little bit. And then very shortly, one will put its nose back up in the, the air. Uh, he's caught something, a small uh, crayfish, perhaps small fish, and he chomps away at it uh, whilst he's swimming. There you are. And thank you very much. And off he goes. We generally see otter on every trip. It's a matter of how many we see. 
Um, we can't guarantee anything, um, but it's a good fire shot that we're going to see an otter at some stage because it's the right type of habitat. It's wet, uh, it's sunny, and as you can see here, the, that combination brings out um, rainbows, double rainbows, and it also contributes to the um, conti continuity of rainforest, the Atlantic rainforest, the temperate rainforest, the Celtic rainforest. It's absolutely awash um, with plants, sustained by ancient sessile oak woodlands, which hopefully, which thankfully are still there. Um, sporting epiphytic plants, lichens, tree lungwort, uh, the porcelain uh, fungi, polypody ferns, horsetails, bramble, in this occasion, bramble welcomed with its um, plant galls as well. And an array of, of plants elsewhere. So early purple orchid, lesser uh, butterfly orchid, um, uh, globe flower in the macaire. And then uh, between the rocks on the cliffs, we've got rose root and uh, cementing the sand together and sand dunes, um, uh, marram grass. Then on the bogs, a couple of extensive bogs, lots of sphagnum moss, penny, uh, marsh pennywort, and a plant that we've seen already this evening, the insectivorous drosera uh, sundew, but three types of sundew, the, ra the round-leaved sundew here, the oblong-leaved, and then the great sundew. And later on in the season, we have the wonderful grass of Parnassus. It's not a grass, it's a, 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 an angiosperm. Uh, with, with uh, obvious petals, but the veins are grass-like, which is where it gets its grass name from, and devil's bit scabious. Ooh. Lots of um, uh, Lepidoptera as well. Checkered skipper are common. Well, they're not anywhere else. It's one of the places where uh, che checkered skippers can be found, and they can, can be uh, very common as well. Moths, of a wide variation of, of moth from uh, migrant to death, death head um, um, moth here, uh, hawk moth, uh, and other moths that we catch uh, with a light trap. Plenty of odonatus, so long to uh, a large red damselfly, uh, common data, um, golden ring, um, and um, Northern emerald dragonfly, lots to see, uh, and equally lots of birds for the photographer to see and photograph as well. Some superb uh, geology. We drive through what essentially 80 million years ago was an active volcano. It's clearly dead now. So we uh, drive through the caldera and three concentric rings of um, solidified magma, which is an amazing uh, and world-renowned uh, geological feature. And we end with the picture postcard, which is uh, Teorum Castle, which is reached by a short walk ac across a causeway. It's fantastic scenery, it's calm, and it's full of wildlife. On this occasion, we can look at a nest of the uh, sea eagle, white-tailed eagle, complete with chick and adult. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. So much to, to learn from all of you there. So, um, yeah, if I could now just welcome all of our speakers back. Um, I say thank you so much for your wonderful presentations. We've had some really lovely comments from everybody here. I think um, Sheila, who joined Matt in Shetland, um, and, and Nikki as well, who did it in 2012 and is, is keen to go back. So, um, yeah, it's, it's lovely to hear that we've inspired you like that. Um, so we please do pop through any more questions you've got. We have had quite a few through privately, um, so I'll pop those to some of the panelists now. Um, but um, but yeah, do do send any more through that you're, you're burning to hear about. Um, so I think the first one is a question for Greg um, that we've had. Um, we've got a lady who's interested in finding the Irish Ladies Tresses Orchid, um, and she'd like to know when is the best time for it, and do their numbers fluctuate from year to year? Um, uh, good question. Good question. Um, uh, the, the it's a late summer orchid, so the July trip is the one we do. As I said, one in May, one in June, and one in July. The July trip is the one with the best chance of seeing the Irish ladies' tresses. Um, 
it depends you with the the dates year on year vary during the course of the month so uh if there's a if there's one coming up i can't remember what the coming years uh dates are but it would tend to be towards the end of july it's the we have seen we have seen irish ladies tresses with a couple of groups in july previously but they tend to be if the trip is at, towards the end of july and if the season suits the early arrival of the uh, of the irish ladies tresses um uh, and yes the the population does fluctuate enormously they're very there are there are yeah, there are probably about 30 locations on coal with Irish ladies or where Irish ladies tresses have been recorded. But each year they don't necessarily appear in each of those locations. So some years, some years are good for them and we can find them in several different places, both traditional sites and new sites. Other years, it can be a real slog to find any. So like with anything in nature, you know, you, you, you have to take your chance and work hard and you, you should be rewarded. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, we have had a few comments that a few people have been struggling to see the slides, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, we will be posting a recording of the, um, the slideshow this evening. Um, so it was appearing fine on my screen, so I'm not quite sure what was going on there, but um, you will be sent the recording. So if you want to watch back, then, then please do. I'll just say that now. Um, so the next question we have with one for Matt, um, who is a lady who would like to know how much walking is involved in the Shetland tour. Uh, yep, uh, so a very good question. And on Shetlands, there's not too much walking at all. So I did mention in my talk um, when on Unst, there's a 45 minute out and back walk uh, to Homeless National Nature Reserve. But elsewhere on the islands, it's relatively easy going. Um, there's lots to see. There's plenty of scenery about. Um, so in that respect, there's not too much walking. We're more admiring the wildlife and the views. Uh, but also um, most walks tend to be out and back. So if you don't feel like walking the entire length, you can just hold back and wait for the group to return or just slowly make your way back. And Shetland, I think, is a wonderful place to do that because you get the scenery and the sounds and everything just by yourself. So it can be extremely memorable if um, you're, in fact, by yourself just for a very short period of time. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. Um, and Martin, we've actually had the same question just for about the Devon tour as well. Do you um, how much walking would we expect to do on that tour? There is quite a bit of walking on that one. And and some of it is a bit up and down. So when we go out in Braunton Burrows, for example, we're walking for uh, probably three to four hours, um, you know, walking slowly. But um, it's, it's definitely a walk. And down Hedden Valley is a walk too. And on Lundy, we, we're walking probably a couple of miles. So, yeah, I think people do find sometimes that it's uh, quite tough. Um, so yeah. that's worth worth bearing in mind. Um, but we have had several people who are well into their 70s and 80s join us. Um, so um, one or two of them said, oh, that was quite hard work. So that's been noted and we've, we've um, modified the amount of walking that we do. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. And I would say again, for any of our, our group tours, if you're concerned or want to know a little bit more about the level of walking or any aspect of the tour, please do give us our, um, our office team a ring. Um, it's those are the questions that we're sort of happy to answer any time. We want to make sure that you're on the right tour for you um, and, and you know exactly what's involved. So please do always feel free to pick up the phone or drop us an email. Um, and we're always more than happy to answer those questions. Um, I've got another question from Matt here. Uh, for a lover of trees, is Shetland completely devoid of trees or are there small pockets anywhere? Are, are we likely to see trees? Well, haha, even on Shetland, trees grow, but um, most are planted. But yes, there are pockets of plantations um, on Shetland, especially in the centre of mainland. Um, there's a place called Kurgord, um, which has um, a, quite a high density of sycamores mainly. Um, and these have, have obviously been planted. But what comes with the sycamores is um, Shetland's only population of rook and jackdaw. So, yes, we do treat you to this phenomenon um, on Shetland of observing rooks and jackdaws, as well as older trees. And in the autumn, um, this area can hold uh, quite a, a good supporting cast of scarcities as well, with, with yellow-browed warbler uh, being probably the most conspicuous. But I have seen blue throat there on last year's tour as well so um, anything crops up there but yes there are certainly trees um on shetland just not that many 
Fantastic. Pleased to hear it. Thanks, Matt. Um, another one from Martin here. Um, in northern England, the high brown fertility is becoming scarcer year on year. Are the numbers in Devon stable or is it species on the brink? I would say it's on the brink. Yeah, it's uh, getting hard to find them. And they're only in one tiny part of Head and Valley and a few other areas on Exmoor. So it's quite worrying, really. Mm. There's a privilege to be able to find them. Mm. Really, Absolutely. Very sad. Not mm. sure what the problem is, maybe climate or can't say really. Mm. If we knew we'd do something about it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh and another one for Matt. Um on Shetland, are the autumn tours the same length? And is there an option to fly? Um yeah. Uh yes, there thankfully is an option to fly because not everyone likes boats. Uh I remember when I first took a boat, I hated it, but now I'm quite used to it. But yes, there is an option to fly. Um it's only roughly an hour, 20 minute flight from Aberdeen, or you can opt for the 12 hour overnight ferry. Entirely up to you. Um, but our autumn tours um, are the same length as the uh, spring tour. So nine days in all, start in Aberdeen, end in Aberdeen. So technically you get seven days um, on Shetland, six nights. And our autumn tours, they're mainly based um, in Lerwick and it's single centred as well um, and Lerwick gives um, a great launching pad to venture to all the outer islands and all remoter areas um, of the archipelago which is quite important mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. autumn whereas in the spring tours we dedicate to our time at the seabird colonies and various other points of interest. Um, Fantastic. Uh, and the same person would like to know, um, well, they say they're keen on the autumn tour um, because they'd like to see the rare birds, but are the seabirds still present for those tours? Uh, no, so they would have departed around August time and our autumn tours commenced late July, early, early October to coincide um, with the, the bulk of rarities that venture um, onto Shetland. Great, thank you. Um, and another question here, very topical one. Um, how has the bird flu affected seabird populations on Shetland, Lundy and Cole? Okay, I'll start with Shetland. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so last year when it was rather apparent that uh, bird flu was amongst the, uh, the seabird colonies, um, it decimated populations um, especially the gannets and the great skewers um, on Shetland but this year um, rather remarkably it hasn't had as great an effect as some thought obviously numbers are still coming in I don't have stats to hand but um, there are still bonksies um, on Ernst and still attacking humans as they traipse past um, their nesting sites and the seabird colonies are still as impressive as they were but it, i think it's more of a, a timely thing where we find out in a few years uh, just to see how much effect um it has had i don't know about you greg and um, uh, Martin. yeah and we've we've definitely seen a, a reduction in our great skewer population um breeding numbers are, are really down uh, this year in particular and walking on the beaches during the summer uh, quite a, evidence of quite a high level of uh, of seabird mortality, corpses being washed up on the beaches. Um, the the difficulty is, I think, the, the, you know, I, I look around and I go, oh, I think there are fewer gannets than usual. I'm sure there are fewer gannets than we usually see, but but that doesn't really help. It's just a, a, a one person's perspective. I think it's the the kind of the 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 proper analysis that's being done and the data crunching that's going on will tell us. Uh, will tell us more clearly what's what what has happened. The one thing I would say though is that um, all these seabirds tend to be quite long-lived uh, individuals. So those which do survive um, this epidemic of bird flu, uh, they they will have a they will have a long period of time in which to in which to uh, uh, hopefully hopefully kind of rebuild those populations once once the once the uh, the, the epidemic has passed. An important point. And, and, the, and the picture I showed of the on longer of the, the guillemots um, that was taken this year, uh, there didn't seem to be uh, heavy mortality when I was there at the time. However, um, populations of, of Arctic terns on in, on um, Northumberland, for example, crashed later on in the summer. So, as uh, as Greg is suggesting, it it needs time for the. Uh, uh, for the data to be collected, analysed and shared. I'm sure that uh, there will have been damage, um, but equally I'm positive, 
I'm, I'm positive that the birds will, will bounce back. Good, hopefully. Fantastic. Uh, so, Steve, somebody, Peter, has mentioned um, that there was no... Some update on Lundy, if you want. That, that oh, Lundy is uh, Lundy is actually seems to have escaped pretty lightly from, from bird flu. But um, here in Braunton, I actually had a, a herring gull collapse in the garden and I took it to the vet and bird flu was diagnosed. So that was on the mainland. So nothing uh, serious on Lundy. Certainly herring gulls have had... Uh, it, but we don't have the large species, which seems to um, affect um, be affected by bird flu more than the small ones. I think mm -hmm. it's true to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> so That's pretty good fun. news, really. Yeah. Great. Uh, so sorry, Steve. Um, so Peter has mentioned that you didn't mention any Scottish wildcats on your tour. Do we not do any lamping for? Yes. Yes. I, I, I didn't mention it because I, I didn't write it down in my script, so my apologies, <laughs> Peter. Um, there, there, there are uh, wildcat on uh, Ardner Merkham, I am assured. I'm assured by, uh, I spoke about Neil Roundtree, um, but they are far, far uh, more elusive than they used to be in the 70s and 80s. There was, there was a population crash, and uh, you are very, very fortunate to see them and yet they are there which is why uh, we continue to look for them and one day just one day like Matt's, Matt's orca um, we, we might see one. In fact this summer um, we were in the Ariundel Centre um, uh, for a while and somebody came in really excitedly and told us all about his sighting of, uh, of a wildcat. The problem um, is that that enthusiasm might not necessarily uh, convert into a, a, an absolute um, sighting because the, um, uh, the the chances of of inbreeding with domestic cats and producing feral is very very high. However, um, the optimism for the future is that there is a recovery program going on on Ardnamurkin, and um, hopefully over time that will have the same level of success that the, um, uh, the white-tailed eagles has had. The wildcat is the most elusive of the mammals um, within, uh, within Britain. Um, so the chance of being able to see it popping out um, to say hello to us is, is remote, but the chance remains. So we will continue to um, search and look. And when we find one, we'll tell you, don't worry. We'll tell you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Optimism for the future. I like it. Um, and just another one for Steve, actually. Um, so you did some um, talk about the bunkhouse um, staying at Arthur Merkin. How basic is the bunkhouse? What are the facilities like um, that you'll be staying at there? Well, it, it's been converted. It, it, used to, it used to actually house the, uh, the, the dogs um, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the, the stalking of the deer. Um, it's been converted. So uh, it's an L-shaped building, and the area that um, uh, is within that L is covered, and it, it's, a, it's a useful um, uh, meeting point and, and table tennis playing point as well. The um, all of the rooms are en suite. Uh, some are double, some are single, and then there is a, a small kitchen. So you we we will cook a, a, a bacon and eggs, a, a fried breakfast for everybody. Um, if if an individual wants to cook their own, uh, then that's possible as well. But it is a small um, kitchen, but it does allow allow you to make your own tea and coffee throughout the day when when you want and bacon or uh, toast, whatever. There is a dining area and there is a um, comfortable lounge area as well. So it's it's not it, it's not a four star hotel, uh, but it's comfortable and um, there is a fridge and, and freezer. So you can the, the last group I was, I was with uh, just just had a party every night uh, whilst they waited to see the the pine martin turn up or, or, um, outside and watching the birds on the feeder and the uh, the deer uh, wandering about outside. So it, it's 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 good spec. It's not high class, but it's in the right place uh, at the right uh, right position. I think Greg, you've been so. What do you think? Uh, as, as Steve says, it's it's basic but comfortable, and uh, 
and and very because of that i think it kind of builds quite a nice rapport within the group when you know when you're working together as a group and you know doing breakfast together and doing the washing up and that sort of stuff that all kind of helps with the with the bind provided people coming on the tour recognize that that's going to be a part of the a part of the package uh, rather than being being weighted on hand and foot as you might uh, uh, in other locations Absolutely. And that's part of our job is to manage people's expectations. And again, just make sure the right people are on the right tour. Um, and we can guarantee you'll be in the absolute best place for the wildlife. Um, and we'll give you a great opportunity for that. So, um, but do ask as many, many questions um, as you like before before deciding whether or not you can join us. Uh, so I think that's about all we've got time for this evening. But again, thanks so much to all of our speakers. Um, yeah, really inspiring evening. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, so we, we love putting on these presentations for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real privilege for us to be able to talk to you about these areas that we're so passionate about. Uh, so our next roadshow evening will be on Tuesday evening uh, when we'll be doing something entirely different uh, and we'll be going to Africa. Uh, so again, myself and a few of my colleagues from the office, along with some of our excellent tour leaders, uh, will be here then. So do join us at 7.30 next Tuesday for our Africa evening. Um, but in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much again for joining us um, and hopefully see you again soon.